I'd like to begin with a poem, Traders of the Night by Rudyard Kipling. If you wake at midnight and hear a horse's feet, don't go drawing back the blinds and looking up the street. Them that asks no questions can't be told a lie. Watch the wall, my darling, as the gentlemen go by. Five and twenty ponies trotting through the dark. Brandy for the parson, backy for the clerk. Laces for a lady, letters for a spy. And watch the wall, my darling, as the gentlemen go by. Brandy. The pub trade is all I've ever known. My name is Mrs. Elizabeth Gulliver, and I was born in an inn not far from here, the Blacksmith's Arms over at Thorny Down. Perhaps some of you know it. It was my father, William Beale. He used to run the Blacksmith Arms, among other trades. He was also a blacksmith, a keeper of the poor book, and he was in the free trade, you know, a smuggler. And truth be told, this was an excellent combination. Being a blacksmith meant that he could keep the ponies very well shod. Being a smuggler, meant, being an innkeeper, meant that he could uh, keep a lot of the spirits and wine and brandy undercover. And being the keeper of the poor book, well, he could tell who was in need of a few extra pennies. And being a smuggler, it was all very helpful to have those trades. And I, well, I learned to run the pub from as early as I can remember. After mother had died and father was out all hours of the day or night. I learned a lot from my father's apron strings. I learned how to not speak everything that you see how to mind your manners as best you can, and how to tell a grown man to get out of the pub when he'd got too rowdy. Little did I know how helpful these things would be when I was to marry Mr. Isaac Gulliver. I could also read and write, and I was particularly good at counting and numbers, not like most of the other young girls and women around these parts. And I was 26 when Isaac first came into the pub. Most of the other young women in the village were married with five children by that time. But from the people who would come into the, to the inn and uh, some of my father's dreadful suggestions, I had not thus far found the right man for me. And my father did want me to be happy. And when Isaac Gulliver first came in, he had, he was a handsome fellow, wool brown eyes, and we got, to, we got chatting, he could tell a good story. But not like the other, lot of the other gentlemen who came into the pub, there were a lot of charmers, but I was cold to their smooth talking ways. But Isaac, I could tell he was clever. He had wit. He was a man of good character, a gentleman. And a flame soon kindled between us. Father didn't approve. He thought that uh, this upstart 23-year-old young free trader was just after marrying me to get his hands on his pub. And we were married very quickly. It all happened so fast. We, were met, we met in the spring and we were married by the October. The 5th of October, 1768, up here at St Mary's Church in Sixpenny Handley. Lace.
change was in the air that day. The October sky was hazy blue and the golden sun was shining through puffs and patterns of white cloud. The green leaves were changing to brown. My wedding day. And even though it had all been arranged very quickly, Isaac had made sure that I had the finest fabrics for my wedding dress. I had a collar and cuffs of French lace. I was dressed in red silks from Spain, deep, warm, autumn red. I made my dress myself with my friend Anne and it fitted perfectly. And although we had to get married, married quickly because Isaac didn't like to go around things in the usual ways, he said that rather than give notice to the people of the parish and uh, alert the church and let them know what was going on and give notice as you normally would, well, he had gone to Blandford to buy a license. He said he could not wait. He said, he didn't want to give my father a chance to say no. I said, people will talk, Isaac. They'll think we need to get married quickly, but my wedding dress fitted me perfectly that day and for the months to come. <laughs> and in those clothes, well, I felt beautiful, quite shy and self-conscious and Isaac wouldn't stop looking at me. It was, a, it was a special, but it was a strange day. There were so few people there. I've got no brothers or sisters and people in the village, they were busy working or looking after the children. But the most missed person that day was my father. Two of Isaac's associates signed the wedding certificate and I wrote my own name. I didn't need to write it with an X. Elizabeth Beale. But in my nervousness, I dropped a blot of ink on the wedded certificate. Wine. Your health. Well, after we were married, Isaac came to live with us at the blacksmith's arms, and it was tense at first because of the father situation. <laughs> but Isaac soon proved his worth. And it didn't take long for Isaac and my father, William, to be working closely together in the trade. And my father, he decided to spend more time doing the blacksmithy and Perhaps there was some arrangement between him and Isaac. I'm not sure. But it wasn't very long until he handed over the running of the pub to my husband, Isaac Gulliver. <coughs> now, smuggling is a dangerous game, as I will go on to explain. And uh, there are many secrets involved in it. And I'm hoping that I can trust you to keep some of them under your hat. trade grew. With Isaac's energy and cleverness, with my practical skills and inside knowledge, soon trade in the blacksmith's arms was, was booming and Isaac's operations were getting bigger and bolder and better. There were comings and goings at all times of night. I was forever opening doors, closing hatches, beckoning people along to the secret hideaways and sometimes simply looking the other way. So trade was booming. Now, but as I said, smuggling was against the law and it was a dangerous game. We always had to be on the lookout for the king's men. Sometimes people called them the revenue men, the excise men, the preventive men. But whoever they were, we had to keep our wits about us to not get caught from them. It wasn't long after Isaac had taken over the blacksmith's arms that he first 
sent quite a mischievous message to the king when he changed the name of the pub to the king's arms. <laughs> the king, King George III. Let's talk about him. Not a popular man around these parts, I can tell you, because people were working for very low wages, but they were paying very high taxes. And they were paying tax on their luxury goods, on their tea, wine, lace, brandy and tobacco, for example. Tax. It's a complicated business, isn't it? <laughs> Who here understands tax? I mean, perhaps, no. Some of you, I mean, perhaps some of you pay tax and, and perhaps some of you do not. Now, let me explain a little bit. Now, um, what's your name, madam, if I may be so bold as to ask? Pardon? Stevie. Stevie. Now, let's say, Stevie, that you are a rope maker. Okay, you're... Um, you know, your hands are really sore, your back's broken, your eyesight is failing, and to make a little bit of money on the side, you are selling some tea. You buy the tea for one pence. I buy it from you for five pence, and I have to give the king three pence in tax. You bought it for the one pence, then that only leaves you the one P. Barely enough to buy clothes and food and shoes for your children. And what did King George III want with all of this money? Well, tax can be a very useful thing, can't it? And the king had choices. And he chose to spend it on his wars with France. Plus a change. <laughs> we were getting on very nicely with the French, thank you very much. Let's just say that all was cordial with the cordials. <laughs> And we all knew as well that the king's men, well, they liked a little bit of cut price wine, the rest of, the same as the rest of us. And the vicar, the vicar wasn't going to be spending over the odds on his Sunday communion wine. No. In the king's arms, there was a secret window. If you went into the private room, as all of us must at some time, the toilet, then you could look through this small window from the toilet right through into the bar and there you could see the open, you could see the front door. So if the king's men had come into the pub, then you could see them there and plan your escape. Tobacco. Isaac Gulliver smoked a pipe, as my father had done. My father always had a long white clay pipe hanging out of his mouth. You could smell Isaac before you saw him coming. A kind of musty odour, half pleasant like a good bonfire and half bitter like the bottom of a burnt saucepan. My husband he organised for huge quantities of tobacco to be smuggled. He was a very successful businessman. At one time, he had 15 luggers, you know, those sturdy, swift ships that would sail between France and England and England to France, laden down with smuggled goods. He did trade all over the continent from France down to Spain, across to Holland, over to Portugal, and even as far as the West Indies and beyond, bringing goods to share around the whole of a Cranbourne chase and the rest of Dorset and the edges of it. He'd done the heavy work of a tub man when he was younger. He was tall and strong, Isaac, and he needed to be, carrying those barrels of brandy and and bales of, uh, of tea and tobacco all wrapped up in oil skins to stop them getting wet. And they would carry them from the boats to the beaches. 
him and his men, carrying them across fields and forests, far inland, miles and miles inland, with the help of the ponies and carts, sometimes by hand, bringing them up as far as places like this, Sixpenny Handley and beyond. Backbreaking work, out in all weathers, in the sea with treacherous tides, walking across the hills and wooded valleys of Dorset, in rain, fog, wind, ice, and sticky heat. And if you ever saw a man with white powder in his hair, well then you knew that he was one of Isaac Gulliver's men, a white wig as they were called. They put white powder in their hair, just as the lords and marquises and uh, wealthy gentlemen did. But I will tell you one thing about the white powder that they put in their hair, those rich gentlemen, it was not taxed. And do you think that those white wigs wanted to be out working all day in the fields mostly and then having to do that back-breaking work all night just for a little bit of extra money in their hand or a, a bit of backy in their pipe? My husband was a gentleman smuggler. He never killed a man. And he was known as the king of the smugglers. Tea. Well, whether you're married to a king of a smuggler or an ordinary tub man, there is not a night that goes by when you're not worrying about your husband out there. Whether he's going to be drowned in terrible seas or flake out on, side, on the hillsides or get caught by the preventive men. Many is the night that I have spent awake worrying about my husband. <coughs> But tea, drinking tea with friends is a lovely thing to do. Friends, there's that saying, isn't there? Keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. Did we have enemies? People that didn't like us, hated us even, were furious at what we did? I suspect that the answer is yes. But there was more folk over the Cranbourne chase that liked and respected Isaac Gulliver and hopefully myself too, than didn't. There were some friends that I felt a lot more comfortable taking tea with than others. For example, when, um, when Mrs Parker, the, uh, the vicar's wife, came over, and Mrs Fry, when she came over, the judge's wife from Blandford, we enjoyed tea and we all loved a lovely piece of fruitcake as well. We were all in the same boat, you see. All our husbands were involved one way or another in the trade. Mm -hmm. And we didn't ask too many questions because we didn't really need to. We understood their business and we played our part. I would hear all kinds of things uh, from uh, Mrs Parker, the vicar's wife, because she picked up things along the vicary gossip lines. She had heard that down at St Andrews near Kinson, and in other churches around the area as well, the uh, free traders, the smugglers, they would bring the goods up from the cliff sides over the fields to the edge of the church. And then, under the cover of darkness, they would tie rope around those goods. And uh, on the inside was another person on the inside of the big, tall church tower. And then, with a pulley system, quietly, quietly, they would pull up the goods and lower them down inside the church tower. And once inside the church, well, there's plenty of places to hide in a church. 
There were the empty crypts and graves, little nooks and crannies, and all sorts of places beneath the ground. And Mrs. Parker, well, but apparently the vicar's wife, she was getting a little bit worried that the preventive men, the king's men, would begin to notice the, the marks being made by the ropes on the stone in the church. They were not getting any smaller. And Mrs. Fry, the judge's wife, well, let's just say that when people, any, any uh, smugglers were brought before Mr. Fry, they didn't face too bad a punishment <laughs> because those smugglers were in great danger of terrible punishment. If they were caught by the king's men, there would certainly be bruises and beatings. They would be thrown in jail, maybe throw away the key or worse than that, hung from their necks at the gallows until they were dead. We had plenty else to talk about when we were drinking tea together. We had our charity work to think about because I had learnt well from my father, William, as keeper of the poor book. And we didn't ask too many questions. We didn't need to know what we didn't need to know. And we knew what we knew. And, uh, well, there was a lot that we did know. hush -a -bye, my little crumb. The sheep are far from home. The hens are to the far, far field and won't be home till noon. Mm -hmm. my babies, my little ones, wrapped in silk and lace like the royalty you were. First, 1770, my little namesake Elizabeth, always wise beyond her years. And next, 1773, Anne, with her shock of black hair and independent streak. And last but not least, young Isaac, 1774, so slender, taken too young, the last born with the shortest life. He died at 24, when his lungs, lungs lost their battle with pneumonia. Hush a -bye, my little crumb. Tobacco. Isaac and I, we lived in some very fine farmhouses and some grand townhouses in our time. Little could we have imagined it when I was growing up in the inn or Isaac, the son of a small time smuggler. But at heart, we're country people and we know the country ways of growing, hunting, fishing, making and mending. One of the very first things I learned about Isaac was how much he loved to eat venison. Stewed, roasted, or in a pie. Anyway, he loved it. And when he wasn't out on the hillside smuggling or organizing for other people to be doing so, well, round here, he would go out with a few companions and go out into the woodlands around Sixpenny Handley and catch a woodland deer. 
to get the venison. There were some people that said he shouldn't trespass on the squire's land, but Isaac, he didn't mind bending the law a little bit. So he would go out under cover of darkness at night and they would get the venison, but he needed to hide it somewhere. So going up to the church here at St. Mary's, there was an empty tomb, a hollow grave. And it was there that he would put the hot goods, sometimes the meat and sometimes the other smuggled goods in there. And then they would share out the meat. Some to the people in the village who needed extra protection against sickness and disease, and some for ourselves. And I would ask Cook to make Isaac a pie. And after we'd eaten, we would go into the drawing room, sit down, feeling like a lord and a lady, and by the glowing fire, Isaac would smoke his pipe, and then he would fall asleep. Wine. March, 1778. A bitterly cold night. The kind of March night where the winter cold is clinging on and fighting the hope that spring tries to bring. The witching hour, three o'clock when all good folks should be in their beds. When six black dragoons were out in the hills and woods of Dorset, looking for the smugglers. Black dragoons, dressed in bright red jackets, riding sleek black horses, six of them. They had heard a rumour that there was a big shipment going to be dropped off at Poole, but whether that was true or not, they did not know. They had seen footprints in the mud, but it wasn't enough to go on, not enough at all. They knew that those traders were going to be out somewhere, but was Sturminster Marshall the right place to find them? Muffled sounds. Panting breath. And then one of them, through the bare branches of the trees, saw the hot breath of a horse rising like mist and the sound of muffled voices. Or the black dragoons. They thought it was the smugglers and so they hoped that they were not to be outnumbered this time as they had been outnumbered so many times before and they was marched and they stormed towards the smugglers in a raid because it was only a handful of them this time and those smugglers they put up a fight of course they did and with fists and sticks and kicks there was a fight and there was beatings and bruises that cold March night and there were also some humiliated furious smugglers as those black dragoons took back with them that night to Blandford Forum to the supervisor's warehouse nine casks of wine and three quarters of a ton of tobacco. Cook was up and I was upstairs getting dressed when the knock came at the door. The kind of heavy knock so early in the morning that can only mean trouble. I heard loud voices downstairs. Isaac in a heated conversation with another man and then the door banged behind them and he was gone. And I spent the rest of the day, as I had spent many days before and since, getting on the best I could, despite the worry. Isaac, he had gone to Thickthorn Farm, a place close by where he often met, uh, met his white wigs. I heard the bit from him the next day and also from the gossip that was going around the village. And they had gone to Thickthorn because nobody takes what belongs to Isaac Gulliver. Not even the king, unless they're going to pay for it. Because Isaac was not a thief. He bought everything he traded. 
So he called for the white wigs to come. And as soon as they could, they came, leaving their work as soon as they were able, they gathered and they began to plan and plot. And by dusk, a big group of them, they rode purposefully on their horses down the Salisbury Road towards Blandford, marching into that town, past the grand houses, not being quiet at all. And the crowds began to gather and watch as they passed by. And they went up to the supervisor's house and they knocked heavily on his door. Good evening, sir. Bring out what belongs to me. There was no answer. No black dragoon made a sound or showed their face. So Isaac and his men, they went to the warehouse and he ordered the white wigs bash down the door. And inside that dank warehouse were nine casks of wine and three quarters of a ton of tobacco. Well, they loaded it onto the carts. And when those carts were full, they rode out of Blandford, past those grand houses, which Isaac knew exactly what they looked like in on the inside. And they left Blandford, saying goodbye to those crowds of onlookers, and they brought it back to us. Isaac Gulliver, he never killed a man. He was my husband, a man that I could rely on. Tea. A gentleman smuggler needs a gentleman's house to drink tea in and a chance to get the best china out. We owned many houses, many farmhouses, but the time came as Isaac's business was growing and the children were getting older that I wanted somewhere to settle down for longer. And Isaac was of a mind to go back towards Kinson where he had been born. And he set about designing a house for us, a house that would be both home for us family, but also be a place that could help his business needs. And he set about building Howe Lodge down near Kinson. It was big and white. It had crenellations on the top like a castle going up and down. On the edge of it was a moat and it was surrounded by a big gate. The walls were thick and to get inside there was a smuggler's gate with no metal hinge, but a leather hinge, so that you could silently go in, and a hook and a bolt that meant once you were in, you could not get out, or once you were out, you could not get back in. Once inside the house, there were so many trapdoors, secret passageways, secret ladders, lofts. I knew where most of them were, and so did the children. <laughs> when you first went into the hallway, there was a magnificent fireplace. It looked so grand. It suited us down to the ground. One day, slender young Isaac, he climbed into that fireplace. And inside there, there were the rungs like up a ladder. And he climbed up there into a tiny secret room. I was wondering where he was nearly all the day. And it wasn't till hours and hours later when hunger got the better of him that he came down again and told me where he'd been. One day, Elizabeth, she'd had enough of the little ones. And so she took herself up, off up a secret stairway, up through a trap door, out to the, up to the loft. No, that did panic me because from the loft you could go out onto the roof or go right down to the cellar. Now the cellar was big and that was definitely a place that was for Isaac's business needs. <laughs> but 
But there were days when they had a lot of fun playing hide and seek. And they didn't know where everything was kept. They didn't know, as only I and Isaac did, the several places where the money was kept. And they didn't know where the tunnels were, thank goodness. The tunnels leaving from the east of the house and the west of the house, joining up with other places nearby. That place, it was home and it was fortress because we did need to be careful. And those revenue men, they did pay us a visit. Visits. Lace. White lace as precious as gold. Lace for the young and lace for the old. Lace for the table where I take my tea. Lace for the white wigs who bring it to me. Isaac's business grew so big. He was mostly organising for other people to go out at night. And there was many a night that we spent together at home. But we knew, without having to speak to each other about it, that in the hillsides and the hedgerows of the Cranbourne Chase, there were the smugglers out there keeping busy. And the king's men hot on their heels, trying to catch them. And we knew the tricks. Sometimes the smugglers would ask some of the women to dress from cap to toe in white and paint their faces white. And they would tell them exactly where to stand. And then when the king's men would come, would come along, well, then they would spook and scare them away. <laughs> and they would uh, scarper those preventive men because those superstitious old devils, they were worried about the old folk tales, about getting their spirits stolen in the night. <laughs> and that meant that the smugglers could get on with their business. And there were other stories too. Sometimes at dusk, just as the sun was setting, the sound of horses' hooves would be heard coming into the village. And behind the horses there would be being pulled a funeral carriage. And inside the funeral carriage was a coffin. Do you think there was a body in that coffin? There was some different kind of spirits in there. <laughs> Wine and brandy rattling through the village on their way to the secret mm. hider place. <laughs> yes, we heard some stories. We needed to stay one step ahead. And when the preventive men found out the king's men, well, their faces were as white as lace, as ashen with shock from finding out that they had been tricked. Brandy. I'm quite partial to the odd tod of brandy in an evening. And it puts me in mind of a story. It was one night and it was late. And I don't know what it was that was keeping me from going to my bed, but I could not sleep and I didn't feel like going to bed, even though Cook and Jenny, the housemaid, had already gone to bed. And then I heard the sound of horses' hooves on turf of storming boots walking towards the house. And Isaac burst in, red-faced, even though the night was cold. And he was panting, heavy with breath. And he said to me, quick, Elizabeth, the, they are on my heels. I have to hide. I would trust you to come up with something. And he put down the cask of brandy that he was carrying, lifted up a trap door, and whoop, he was down, out immediately out of view, as fast as lightning. I knew 
that I did not have long, that those knocks were coming on the door and Isaac had left the barrel of brandy just standing there. Well, I gave Jenny, the house girl, strict instructions to stay calm and let them in. Well, I shuffled over, lifted up my skirts and stood astride that bottle of brandy. Jenny, as instructed, bought two of the king's men inside. And they demanded to see Isaac. No, you cannot see my husband. Yes, he is here as he has been the last few days, but he is not to be disturbed. You can't search this house, not unless you've got a warrant. And I will thank you not to be disturbing a resting household at this time of night. They left, one of them looking quite sheepish, the other one angry, resolved to come back the next day with a warrant. It had given me time to think. The next day, they returned. I was dressed in full black clothing. I had asked Jenny to rub a little ash in her eye to make her eyes red and tearful. And when she let the king's men into the house as she had done the previous night, I stood there solemnly, drew back a curtain to reveal Isaac Gulliver, my husband, lying dead in a coffin, <laughs> pale, cold, and still. This is why you could not see my husband last night, because he had just left this earthly plane. And I would ask you now if you could Leave us at this time of grief and sorrow. And they did. I watched to make sure they left the property from the very edge of it. And when they were gone, we couldn't help but smile. And Isaac, he opened his eyes bright with mischief. And like something out of a ghostly tale, he rose from that coffin and was out. But Isaac being Isaac, well, he couldn't leave it there, could he? Word went out around the place that Isaac had died. And a funeral was arranged <laughs> down in Kinson. And there was a coffin lowered into the ground. No brandy or wine or smuggled goods in it this time. Filled with stones. And it was a good few weeks that people believed that Isaac Gulliver was dead. And when the king's men found out that they had been tricked, well, they resolved even harder to try and get Mr. Isaac Gulliver, that man of great speculating genius. <laughs> they never did catch him. And his white wigs, they never betrayed him. And I have been by his side all of those years. Running the tight ship of the house, giving ideas and advice where needed, helping out with the bookkeeping and the money side of things when asked to. And that is how we lived. wine. But time passes and Isaac eventually eased up on the smuggling trade. In fact, in 1782, he took advantage of the king's proclamation of pardon in such offences. And that meant that all the smugglers were going to be forgiven their smuggling crimes that they had done before if they gave up smuggling now. Isaac decided that he would become a wine merchant. I can't say that he gave up the smuggling altogether. After all, old habits do die hard. 
but he quietened it down a little bit. And so it went on. He was very good at being a wine merchant. He was always good at everything he did. And time went on as being a wine merchant until one terrible year when tragedy struck. That year when our dear son, young Isaac, was taken from us, when he died of pneumonia. Isaac seemed to lose a lot of ambition then. And I must say, I was never quite the same again. And more years passed and we moved to Wimborne and Isaac opened up a wine shop then. And these days, the tunnels below Wimborne, beneath the shops and the houses, well, they weren't so much used for smuggling goods or hiding from the king's men, but for storage. Yeah, time passes. The body weakens, dreams change, but your mind can still stay strong. Tobacco. I have outlived my husband. He died in 1822 at the age of 77. Seems only yesterday that his man John was pushing him round Wimborne in his bath chair, his wicker chair on wheels. Isaac Gulliver. He gave thousands of people help. He gave them work, money, friendship, community, goods. And years later, when we were, were living in Wimborne, well, he was also the church warden there. And he made sure that people in need got what they needed too. He was proud of what he'd done, that he could have helped that many people. And he would be proud to know as well that he is buried in Wimborne Minster, the church that we both loved so much and worked hard for. And also, he can be near to our son, young Isaac. As I said, he was once called a man, a great speculating genius, and he was a clever man always had a plan, always a trick up his sleeve, and he certainly kept me on my toes. But I am still standing, and I have more than I need. Isaac, he made sure that my, me, the children, and the grandchildren were all well taken care of in his will. There were plenty of houses and money to go around, because through his work, and with my help, we amassed a vast fortune. And I am glad that we moved back to Wimborne. I like it in the town. And I'm closer to my daughter Anne and, and Elizabeth. She's given us seven bonny grandchildren. And for young Isaac, when I feel up to it, will Jenny the housekeeper or, or John Isaac's man They'll take me up to the minster to go and visit him. There have always been rumours about my husband. <laughs> and the new rumour that is going around is that if you go into one of the pubs or, or, or farms or houses that we once lived in, you can tell if the ghost of Isaac Gulliver is there. Because you will be able to smell a trace of tobacco smoke. And then you know that the gentle smuggler is near. But for me, he is always near. He was my beloved husband for over 50 years. And it has been my pleasure 
to relive these memories here today with you. I miss him. He was unstoppable.